So this is Bo. Um, he's been having chest pain intermittent for about uh, the last week. All right, let's give him 20 uh, cardizum. All right, we're going to be giving you some medicine continuously through your, your IV, okay? This should really get you feeling better. Okay. How are you feeling, sir? I'm getting really lightheaded. Can you open your eyes, sir? Sir. I don't have a pulse. You have a pulse? Sure, you don't feel a pulse? I don't feel a pulse. Sorry, I don't have a pulse. Okay, all right. Can we start CPR? We were treating a patient for AFib, and we used cardizem, and all of a sudden, the entire bag emptied, and he went hypotensive bradycardic, and then he coded. What happened in that reenactment? Why did the patient die so suddenly? A man by the name of Barnaby Jack, well, he knew exactly why. From 100 meters away, I can scan for any insulin pumps in the vicinity. I will return those insulin pump IDs, and then I can have them dispense their entire 300 units of insulin, which uh, for a type 1 diabetic will easily prove fatal um, unless you seek immediate medical attention. You see, Barnaby Jack has discovered all kinds of ways to hack into medical devices, and he exposed the weakness of every single one he found. By the end of this podcast, you're going to know what the dangers really are, And also, more importantly, how to avoid them. It's all coming up in this week's Commando on Demand. We're talking about one of the top personal threats in security today, hackable medical devices. And before it was public knowledge, a guy by the name of Barnaby Jack, well, he was totally on it. Barnaby wasn't just a hacker. He was the director of an embedded device security company. It had the name IOActive. It's a huge security company out of Seattle and London. There's actually a vulnerability in these devices. Uh, Typically, to be able to communicate with them, you'd need to know the serial number. I have a vulnerability which will let me acquire the serial number from any of these insulin pumps within a 100-meter range. All right, would you believe he even bypassed the security system that was supposed to be protecting patients? Man, it was unheard of at that time. What they don't realize is that I actually disable all of these warnings and that the RF functionality cannot be turned off. It's always listening. Even if you turn off the remote option on the pump, it was, this attack will still work. RF transmitter is always listening. And once I took a look, I was actually quite shocked to find out how many uh, vulnerabilities actually exist there. Barnaby knew too much, and he was about to spill the beans about what he found. I'm trying to go as public with this research as I can just to show how easily these pumps can actually be attacked and hopefully change the mind of the FDA and of Medtronic and of the public that maybe a recall could be in order. And just days before he was supposed to speak at a black hat convention, Barnaby died. His topic, it was supposed to be medical implant devices in humans sick patient comes in and you're hooking that patient up to all these monitors, these gadgets and gizmos, are you going to think a second time about how reliant we are on these technologies and how if one of them should fail or be compromised, how it could impact not just the identity of your patients, but truly the life of your patients? I actually have to choose between an insulin pump and a cybersecurity threat? (laughs) That's just scary. And I can't even believe it's come to this. You have to know this. Hacked medical devices are quickly becoming one of the top security threats of our time. According to research done by Alpine Security, there are now 10 to 15 devices connected to any given hospital bed, many of which are completely vulnerable to attack. And you have to remember, I've said this so many times, anything that connects wirelessly to other equipment can be compromised. Anything connected to the Internet is hackable. But does that totally make you a sitting duck when you're sitting in a hospital bed? Well, it really depends on who you ask. My intention right now is to inform you. I don't want to scare the crap out of you, but you need to know this. To help us out, I've got one of the best, most dedicated experts in the medical device security field joining us today. His name is Christian Espinoza of Alpine Security. Plus, we're going to check in with renowned security expert Billy Rios of White Scope LLC. And let me tell you, you're going to be so informed at the end of this podcast. And you know what I always say, knowledge is power. You're going to know which devices hold the highest risk, where the security weaknesses are located, and how to make smart choices regarding connected health care. The knowledge you need is right here on this week's Commando on Demand. Let's talk about the most recent medical device attacks, because this kind of threat could change the way that you receive health care in the future. 
Just this year, vulnerabilities were found in Abbott Lab's implantable pacemakers. They discovered, just like Barnaby Jack did years ago, that a hacker could issue commands to the pacemaker, causing it to drain its own battery and then give unnecessary painful shocks to the patient. And meanwhile, at Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital, hackers broke into the system. Hospital operations came to a screeching halt for several days while patients waited in their beds, some of them being deprived of health care. Well, the hospital had no choice. They finally agreed to pay the hijackers 17 grand in Bitcoin to have operations restored. And just in the past three months, recalls rose to an all-time high. The Stericycle Recall Index reported an increase of 126% in the first quarter of 2018 from last year. All right, the main reason? Well, it was outdated software, believe it or not. But the other reason is scarier. Hackers are now targeting entire hospital systems instead of, say, individual patients. The famous WannaCry attack devastated the UK's National Health Service, along with several U.S. hospitals. Dr. Christian Demep has been campaigning for tighter security in medical devices for a long time, well, since he was in college. We're going to get to all that, but first, a quick break from one of our partners in this podcast. In addition to being an emergency room doc at UC San Diego, Dr. Christian Demep speaks all over the country about vulnerable medical devices. So he and his team of experts, Dr. Jeff Tully and innovator Josh Corman, are the ones who actually staged that reenactment that you heard earlier. Time and time again, we have security researchers, the good hackers out there of the world, showing us that insulin pumps, pacemakers, medication pumps at bedside, these are all relatively easy to hack. One of those good hackers Dr. Demep was referring to is with us today on the podcast, Christian Espinoza. Christian is a CEO and founder of Alpine Security and a cybersecurity professional at Maryville University. He's a total geek. He's a network and systems engineer, a white hat hacker, a trainer, a consultant, and he's earned over 20 different industry safety certifications. All right. With all of that said, Christian, thanks for joining us. Well, glad to be here. And thanks for the opportunity, Kim. First of all, we need to start at the beginning. I'd like you to explain to our listeners of this Commando On Demand podcast, what exactly is a white hat hacker? What do they do? Why white versus black? A white hat hacker is a hacker that basically is an ethical hacker. It's someone that tests uh, medical devices or a website or an organization, but they don't do anything malicious. The whole purpose of their test is to help the device manufacturer or the organization identify and fix vulnerabilities and problems. So yes, our last ethical hacker guest was from Bulgaria. And I have to say, I'm so glad that you guys are on the good side. I mean, I just read your blog about the most dangerous hacked medical devices. Terrific piece, by the way. Really loved it. But in your experience, what would you consider to be the biggest threats to patients in terms of hackable devices? Probably the fact that per hospital bed, there are anywhere between 10 to 15 electronic devices, and about half of those are networked. They're connected to the hospital network, and a lot of those devices are vulnerable or have vulnerabilities. Uh, I know there's been, you know, we've seen in the news attacks against drug infusion pumps. That's the, really the biggest risk is the fact that all these devices are now starting to be connected to the hospital network, which is basically not a very secure network either. And the hospital network has at some point a connection to the Internet, which effectively exposes these devices next to your hospital bed to the Internet. And, uh, you know, next time you visit the hospital, if you take a look around, you'll see the number of devices that are in your room. You'd think that hospitals were, say, relatively safe. But what is it about hospitals and the technology that makes them so vulnerable? Primarily, there's a couple reasons that they're very vulnerable. One of the reasons is hospitals are pretty much open to the public. Anyone can go to a hospital almost 24 by 7, and you're not going to be questioned about what you're doing. They'll just assume you know, you're visiting a patient. Uh, and because of the nature of hospitals and this openness, uh, and there's a lot of you know coming and going, it's easy for an attacker to walk into a hospital. No one's going to really question them, and they can find a communications closet that's unlocked or maybe a exposed Ethernet network connection, or they could even, like for instance, sit in the hospital cafeteria and try to hack into the hospital wireless network. Have you done any work to help them? 
We've actually done some tests for hospitals, some penetration tests, where we were able to get into the hospital wireless network, and that network was connected to medical devices as well. So you came in, you did the white glove test, so to speak, and then you set them up for better protection. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, We pointed out what we discovered to the hospital and helped them secure their wireless access point and a few other items that we found um, so that that reduces the risk of a malicious attacker actually carrying out one of these attacks. Now, we know that you conduct training and certifications on many levels, even to the point of pretending to be hackers among the hospital staff. That's really cool, but tell us a little bit more about it. What we often see is the personnel, like the medical assistants and the personnel in the hospital, are not very well educated on social engineering types of attacks. So we were able to pretend, for instance, we were like the IT support desk and we've done our research. We had the right points of contact and everything in case somebody questioned us. And we were able to plant devices on the hospital network, like right in front of hospital personnel. Uh, They allowed us to get behind their computer and things like that. Their security awareness wasn't good enough for them to question our motives. And a lot of people don't want to question somebody that's doing something that they think is to help them. Yeah, I think we all tend to trust that when someone from the hospital attaches something to our bodies, it's for our benefit. But maybe that's not always the case. Why don't you share a success story about how your team was able to stop a potential threat? I think that'd be really interesting for our listeners to hear. Sure. Probably one of the, I guess, most successful tests we did um, is we found a vulnerability with a legacy device. That it is in, this device is pretty much at every hospital, and this device is used to test uh, bacteria. And it could not be, the operating system could not be updated. So with this particular device, because the operating system could not be updated, it was vulnerable to an older Microsoft exploit. So it could be exploited across the network. But there was no reason for anyone to connect this device across the network. So our solution was very simple, actually. It was just to enable the Windows firewall, the Windows embedded firewall. This is a Windows embedded operating system to enable that firewall and block all inbound traffic. And that mitigated the risk because if a device in the hospital network could not connect to this device, then uh, it could not exploit the device across the network. The device did need to be networked to for outbound traffic, but not for inbound. So that was a simple fix and that was deployed throughout the world, basically. So it was a worldwide operation, a global deal, not just a local one. That's right, yeah. You've worked over time to find vulnerabilities in not only medical devices, but other systems, too. I'm a little curious about what makes a guy like you tick. I mean, on a personal level, is there a backstory, something that happened? I mean, what inspired you to track down these threats? Well, I used to work for the Air Force and did cybersecurity for the Air Force. So my whole career has been involved with cybersecurity, and I've seen what can be done on a massive scale if the right tactics are carried out. So my my motivation is really to help organizations prevent these things from happening. All right, let's just keep the conversation going here. Along those lines, give us an example of a threat that we wouldn't even know about or maybe even suspect. Since we're talking about medical devices, and, you know, my brain kind of just works in this way. I think of of scenarios that someone could carry out. Uh, There are some devices we tested that are used to test bacteria. So if you have a blood test done, the device will test your blood to see what bacteria you're infected with and then also make a recommendation for an antibiotic. So those devices can be compromised. And if, for instance, you have sepsis and the device says you don't have sepsis, then you could die. But a bigger scenario that I think of are these devices are also used in an industry such as um, hamburger production could really be affected in a negative way. Uh, For instance, an attacker could taint the hamburger supply with a bacteria such as E. coli, salmonella, et cetera, and then attack the device and compromise the device that's used to test the hamburger sample for these bacteria. And if that device test negative uh, for the hamburger sample that has E. coli or salmonella, then the hamburger could be released downstream in the supply chain, and a lot of people could, you know, get killed from that. 
Oh, my gosh, you're so right. I don't even want to think about stuff like that. But it's important. I think it all comes back to just being aware that if something's connected, it's probably vulnerable. But Christian, how in the world do you come up with this stuff? I mean, what's going on in your head? My background is on threat scenarios and how these could be carried out. And I always think of like these scenarios. And if I were an attacker, you know, these are things I could come up with. Uh, so if I can come up with them, they're plausible. And I think it's good for organizations and device manufacturers to work with someone that is aware of these types of scenarios in order to better their defenses against them. What is it that compels these hackers to do what they do? What are their reasons based on your experience? Most attackers or hackers are um, driven by financial gain. So that's the primary motive. You know, there's extortion as a service and ransomware as a service. Extortion and ransom are, are a couple of the main motives to generate revenue for attackers. Um, state-sponsored actors and terrorists and governments, they are not necessarily going to be motivated by financial gain. They may be motivated by some act to help their cause. That act could be you know, killing people, as we see with terrorists, quite a bit, it causes chaos. Or it could be with killing a specific target that is in the way of a political agenda. When we talk about drug infusion pumps and, you know, the vulnerability on those and being able to increase the flow rate for something like a morphine drip that could kill someone, I would say your normal cyber criminals probably wouldn't want to kill somebody, but a nation state or a terrorist might want to kill someone. That would be their motivation. What about attacking an average person who's wearing, let's just say, a pacemaker or an insulin pump? Most cyber criminals are going to use a tactic like ransom or extortion. So if they compromise your pacemaker, for instance, they could hold that ransom and make threats that they're going to stop it against you unless you pay a ransom and then they release like their hold on it, for instance. Because their motivation is to make money. So what's your advice for someone who's been told that they have to wear a connected device? I mean, they'll die without it. The advice really is to be aware that there is a risk from a cybersecurity perspective, and there's a possibility that an attacker could compromise the device. The probability is relatively low, though, and what needs to be considered is the, you know, what is the risk of not having the implantable device? And typically, the risk of not having an implantable device, such as a pacemaker, of not using that device far outweighs the risk of a potential cybersecurity attack. So should we ask our doctors certain questions? I mean, it would make sense to start with, is the software to my pacemaker up to date? Or what measures are you taking to protect my insulin pump? I mean, the doctors should know about this, right? Uh, you can certainly ask those things of your doctor, but I doubt your doctor would have an answer. If you're really concerned about it and your doctor says you're getting um, you know, a particular manufacturer's device, I would go look up and do my own research on that manufacturer's device and any security bulletins that have been released by the manufacturer. But you also have to be aware that if this is a implantable medical device that hundreds of thousands of people have, the device manufacturer is not going to make public or if they do make public, they will not relay the criticality of any findings. Or if they do relay it, it will be in such a manner that it seems trivial because they don't want to have to do a recall on hundreds of thousands of devices or scare you know people that have these implantable devices. And even after vulnerabilities are officially found on their devices, it seems like there are companies who are refusing to admit or maybe just deal with their faulty products. You know, it's bad enough watching my mom go through everything she's been through. But a device recall? That's just a little too much. All right, we've got more from Christian Espinoza of Alpine Security. Plus, we're going to talk about how you can find the latest reports and alerts on all medical products. You need to know this stuff. And then you're going to want to stick around for this. You're about to find out which manufacturers that have had recalls or cybersecurity warnings issued for their devices. This is information that people don't normally share. But first, a quick thank you to one of our sponsors who helped make these podcasts possible. Hey, welcome back. We're speaking with Christian Espinoza. 
He's a white hat hacker, CEO and founder of Alpine Security. So not just one, but all three manufacturers of implanted pacemakers and defibs have had cybersecurity warnings issued for the devices. Medtronic, Boston Scientific and Abbott, formerly known as St. Jude. And after being pressured by the FDA, Abbott did finally recall hundreds of thousands of devices. But I guess the question is, are there any other devices that we should be aware of? Uh, well, there's, there's a lot of devices, um, and it, some of the devices are devices you probably wouldn't even think of, such as uh, there's devices that are used to do surgery on your eyes, that do surgery with a laser, and those devices have software on them. The software has vulnerabilities. Those devices are connected to a clinic or a hospital network, typically a clinic network. And those devices, for instance, um, if they're compromised, then the instrument that's used to track your eye while the laser is cutting your eye, that if that tracking is skewed, then the cuts could be made in wrong places of your eye, for instance. And that's just one example of types of devices that most people wouldn't probably think of. But, you know, next time you're at the doctor or a clinic, if you think about the device that's attached to you and it is doing something, um, or the doctor is using that device and relying on that device for accuracy, you know, that device is probably connected to the Internet and it probably has a vulnerability. And if you just think about some use cases, uh, or I guess misuse cases is a better term for that device, then the um, outcome could be pretty devastating. Christian, can people hire you if they want to know if their device is hackable so maybe you can check it out? That's a good question. We typically work with organizations. I guess it depends on the on the scenario. If there's a patient or a patient advocacy group that is interested in finding out some of the vulnerabilities of the device, then um, that's certainly something we could test. That's good to know. Did you hear that? Find a patient advocacy group. One reputable site is safepatientproject.org. They're the advocacy division of Consumer Reports. They're actually part of Consumer Reports. Also check out MedWatch. This is the FDA Safety Information and Adverse Event Reporting Program. You can find them at fda.gov medwatch. They have this list of the latest safety alerts for medical products of all kinds. And another good tool is the FDA MOD system. Like, you remember that old TV show? M-A-U-D-E, which stands for, you ready? It's the government. They shorten everything up and they make things complicated. MOD stands for Manufacturer and User Facility Device Experience. Phew. All right. Uh, The website address is pretty long, so just do a search for FDA MOD and you'll find it. Speaking of a huge security-based organization, I just found out that you were a bronze sponsor for the 2018 Secure World Denver Conference this year. That's pretty impressive. I wish I could have been there. Do you have anything exciting to report that happened? Uh, Yeah, at that conference, um, one of the panels I was on at the conference, we focused on extortion as a service and ransomware as a service. One of the tactics that a lot of attackers use is if you have gone to a clinic and let's say you have an STD or some disease that's infectious, a lot of attackers will get access to information and basically extort money out of you uh, or they'll, they say they'll release it to the public. So there's that type of attack that we think will increase. And then the ransomware against um, clinics and hospitals has increased. Certainly, you know, we've seen the news, hospitals in California, for instance, that um, haven't been able to accept patients because all their systems are down. So we think that will increase as well, um, because if you can do this on a larger scale, let's say an entire metropolitan area, let's say you deploy some malware that affects all the hospitals in L.A., then you can create a pretty chaotic environment where none of the hospitals can access any information because they're all infected with ransomware. I guess we've seen a few of these cases, but we haven't seen a coordinated attack that uses these tactics on a larger scale yet. Yet. I think that's the key. If you're wearing a medical device, stay up on tech news, the same as you would with any other device that connects up to the Internet. Hey, Christian, thank you so much for your time and for all this great advice today. Before you go, if people want to get in touch with you, maybe sign up for an Internet security certification class or hire your team to do forensics or just a security checkup, how do they get a hold of you? Probably the best way to contact Alpine Security is through our website, www.alpinesecurity.com, 
or um, they can email us at info at alpinesecurity.com. Great. And thanks for taking some extra time, too. I know you're so busy. Yeah, no problem. I appreciate the opportunity. All right, coming up, we're going to hear from Billy Rios, a world-renowned security specialist whose company led the first FDA recall of an implanted medical device. Plus, this famous politician ordered to have his pacemaker disabled. Why? Well, he was afraid a hacker might try to assassinate him. We're going to tell you who he is in just a few moments. Have you ever heard of the RSA conference? Well, you should. It's one of the most crucial security conferences in the world. At first, it was made up of just a handful of cryptographers, but now it's this mega conference. Would you believe about 45,000 people attend at least one RSA conference per year? And like I said, they're held all over the world. You can stream the sessions online too. Now, most RSA attendees know of Billy Rios. You see, Billy is the founder of Whitescope LLC. This is a startup focused on embedded device security. Billy's recognized as one of the world's most respected experts on emerging threats relating to industrial control systems, critical infrastructure, and, of course, medical devices like we've been talking about here. He's actually unearthed thousands of security vulnerabilities. He was the former frontline response leader for Google. So let me tell you something, this guy does not mess around. In fact, Billy's work in the medical device security field is what inspired doctors Tully and Demep to put together that scary but realistic drama that we played at the beginning of the podcast. And it's actually been performed at many security conferences, not just the RSA. If you didn't catch it at the beginning of the podcast, you should really go back and take a listen to it because it's really bone chilling. Anyway, at this past RSA conference, ThreadPost caught up with Billy to hash out some of the details of Whitescope's work. When we look at exploiting medical devices, we kind of look at two different things. One is what's called intended functionality, and basically that just means making the device do that something it was kind of designed to do already. Like, for example, a pacemaker is designed to deliver a shock, right? It's it's actually designed to do that. And so um, if someone can take over the communications path to a pacemaker, they might be able to initiate a shock at a time that it's not supposed to be initiated, right? So um, as far as the consequences go, um, if a device is implanted inside of you, it probably means that you need it all the time, right? So there's only one reason that they do that, right? And so uh, and if you need it all the time, that means it's probably pretty important to your well-being. So um, if anything happens to that device, even if it just doesn't work, like say, for example, you can't communicate with it when you need to, uh, th- those could be pretty disastrous consequences as well, right? Widescope has gone aggressively after companies with proven vulnerabilities. They want them to at least consider getting something that we call a penetration test. It's try to see exactly what might and could happen. And you won't believe what he's finding in some cases. One of the pacemaker programmers we're looking at, it's like literally a Windows XP machine, right? So uh, you wouldn't know that unless you hacked it. But um, once you get access to the file system, you realize that's like a really old computer, basically. Um, And then I think uh, some of the medical manufacturers just aren't very good at response and engineering. And uh, what's kind of kept them alive so far is just obscurity, like getting a hold of these devices and being able to kind of look at them. But I would say that most of the device manufacturers that we work with, uh, they're pretty good. They're pretty responsive. Um, they take this pretty seriously. They, they do have some limiting factors that they have to kind of deal with. Like, it's not easy to pull a device out of someone's chest and replace it, right? So um, it's not easy to push out updates to a medical devices that are supporting someone's life, right? So um, I think for the most part, the majority of the manufacturers we're working with are pretty receptive, but a handful, you know, maybe aren't. So, And in Billy's case, there has been some success. Yeah, there actually has been one public recall. And then um, a lot of the research that we did a couple years ago actually resulted in the first uh, FDA cybersecurity advisory ever, right? So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw more of this. I mean, that's not the preferred way, I think, you know, because that's, it's, to be honest, it's really disruptive to patients. Um, if you had a device or you, you were relying on a particular set of medical devices to help you live a better life, and then you had to turn those devices in and find something else, uh, that's pretty disruptive, right? Especially if it's implanted. So uh, that's probably not the preferred avenue, but it's happened, and I I wouldn't be surprised to see it happening more in the future. I remember reading a report from McAfee. This thing in my chest could be hacked, and so the vitals the doctors see on my report may not actually be my vitals at all. Now, that was obviously a voice actor, but he represents a number of concerned patients who rely on connected medical devices to keep them alive. 
One of those connected patients was former U.S. Vice President Dick Cheney. After he suffered five heart attacks and underwent quadruple bypass surgery, wow, you could say that, okay, this guy needs a pacemaker for sure. But as soon as Mr. Cheney realized that it was possible for someone to hack into his pacemaker and actually kill a patient, he ordered it disabled. As he told CNN chief medical correspondent Dr. Gupta on a 60 Minutes episode, he was concerned about reports that hackers could actually hack the device and kill the owners. And guess where he got that information? All right, where a lot of people get their information, a TV show. All right, this one was called Homeland, and the last episode was really frightening. A cold-blooded killer hacks into a connected device and tries to assassinate someone. It must have hit home for Mr. Cheney. That show changed his life. He realized right then, as he told 60 Minutes, that it was an accurate portrayal of what was possible. Those were his exact words. As far back as a year before that, the U.S. Government Accountability Office went after the FDA because they refused to address the possibility that medical devices were susceptible to intrusions in malware. So as you can see, researchers were uncovering all these vulnerabilities even back then. And one of those researchers was the late Barnaby Jack. In 2012, Jack's testimony led the FDA to change regulations regarding wireless medical devices. So the FDA finally listened. They got busy telling medical device makers and hospitals to strengthen security. Well, did the companies listen? Some did, but many of them, well, I would even go so far as to say the majority of them just didn't. We take care of patients every day in the hospital, and we as doctors implicitly rely on these types of technologies, and we never second-guess them, and maybe we should. Are you going to think a second time about how reliant we are on these technologies and how if one of them should fail or be compromised, how it could impact not just the identity of your patients, but truly the life of your patients? I would definitely think about it. It would be devastating to the entire healthcare system if uh, things were hacked. Those medical devices will sometimes share code and hardware in other industries. And because these types of things are shared, the vulnerabilities are shared. If it can infect one, it can infect all of them. Medical device hacking isn't just a hypothetical scare. Researchers from all over the world have come forward with the truth that basically it's really easy to hack MRIs, anesthesia machines, nuclear medical devices, pacemakers, insulin pumps, and a whole bunch more. Two of those researchers were able to access 21 anesthesia, 488 cardiology, 67 nuclear medical, and 133 infusion systems. But wait, there's more. 31 pacemakers, 97 MRI scanners, and 323 photo and communications data. Whoa. And all that I just said, that was just from one healthcare organization. They also found dozens of vulnerabilities in other medical devices. The security researchers devised what they call honeypots. These are basically fake machines that disguise themselves as the real deal, the real equipment, and they lure in hackers into an attack. Get it? Like bees and honey, honeypots. Well, can you guess how many hackers took the bait? All right. Hold on to your hats, folks. Get this. More than 55,000 successful logins, 299 malware payloads were deployed. All right. If you think nobody's out there trying to hack you 24-7, you better think again. Here's another thing. When Zingbox probed the minds of clinical and biomedical engineers, the results shocked the Internet security world. Whoa, 85% of them are actually confident in the inventory accuracy of all their medical devices, even though most of them rely on outmoded manual room-to-room audits. So as we spoke about in this podcast, just about anyone can walk into a hospital room unnoticed And with the patient lying there helpless, could essentially steal a small device. The disappearance may not be noticed for days or even weeks or maybe never. The survey also showed that more than half of the engineers have to physically examine the device before they're allowed to schedule repairs. Okay. A lot of times, well, there's a patient attached to that device. And if that's the case, exams are a no-go. They have to try again sometime in the future, just hoping for better luck. Computer hackers soon could cross into a new frontier, and it looks like there's the precious few who are poised to defend the borders, and with the right tools, a hacker would have the power to kill through, say, insulin pumps or defibs and pacemakers and other personal medical devices. And just think about it. 
With all the new personalized healthcare apps out there, millions of patients' information is stored online. The apps may be secure, but the devices themselves are really vulnerable. Hackers could do a lot of damage, like, say, creating a false stock plunge of a particular device. The most important thing for you to know is whether your device is connected to a network. Being aware, of course, is the first step. You don't have to lie awake at night worried that someone's going to stop your heart while you're asleep. Just remember what Christian Espinosa said. The incidents are still very low. Okay, that may still keep you up at night because if it's keeping you alive, it certainly would keep me up too. So what you want to do is ask your physicians. Find a patient advocacy group too. Try safepatientproject.org. They're part of Consumer Reports. And like I mentioned before, there's also MedWatch, which is the FDA Safety Information and Adverse Event Reporting Program. Okay, all big words, but that's how they describe it. You'll find them over at fda.gov slash MedWatch. That's for a list of all the latest safety alerts for medical products of all kinds. You also want to check out the FDA Mod System, M-A-U-D-E. Just do a search for FDA Mod and you'll find the link. And I'd like to thank Jeff Tully. The anesthesiologist at UC Davis hit the nail on the head when he said, with great connectivity comes great responsibility. Sure does. And that goes for the manufacturer, but not just the manufacturer, the doctor, and not just the doctor, the patient. I'd like to thank my guest, Christian Espinosa of Alpine Security, for taking a great deal of time to speak with us today. We really appreciate the personal touch, always. And thanks to Billy Rios of White Scope LLC, Drs. Jeff Tully, and Dr. Christian Demep, Threat Post, Cronkite News, and Zingbox. I'm America's Digital Pro, Kim Commando. And I hope you got as much out of this podcast as we did here at the studios. You know, one of the perks of working at commando.com is that we all get paid to learn these really fabulous things. And then we share what we learned with you. Okay, your part is to pay it forward. It's free, so why not share it, like it, comment on it? And if you're the CEO of a company, you may actually want to sponsor a podcast of ours. It's just one of the ways that you can show your support of what we do at commando.com. And hey, if you shared this podcast right now, it would totally make my day. Don't hide all this knowledge for yourself. Do me a favor, share it with a friend and have a happy, healthy day. 